Over the past few weeks, uh, we've been retelling family stories. We've been remembering who we are in Christ. We've been telling the stories of God's redemption for the world and God's redemption for individual people. And those of us who have had the opportunity to preach during this series get to stand up here and we get to be the grandfathers and grandmothers, no, no, the aunts and the uncles, retelling the family stories. And we get to sometimes hear those stories for the first time for some of us. And for others of us, we've heard these family stories over and over and over again. And we get to listen to them and remember who we are in God. And as we've heard these stories, the ones this summer, a lot of these stories we've heard have had these big and powerful works of God, right? Creation of the world out of nothing. We've had stories of floods and rainbows. Stories of dreams interpreted. This is not one of those stories. This is a story of what seems like an insignificant family doing seemingly insignificant things. A a family in poverty. A family who is struggling. And a God who seems to be silent. And so we want to lean in to this particular family story. This could be your story. This could be my story. This isn't the story of some world leader. This is a story of a small family from Bethlehem. And the writer, the the person telling the story, starts like this. At the time when the judges ruled in Israel. And so the people listening to the story go, oh yeah, here it comes, some Game of Thrones kind of stuff. There's going to be intrigue. There's going to be a battle. There's going to be some some crazy stuff going on. In the time when the judges ruled in Israel, a man took his family and moved to Bethlehem. His name was Elimelech, and the heir just comes out of the people who are listening. Let me put it in a little bit of context for you. It'd be like if I was going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story of when William Wallace and Robert the Bruce lead the Scottish rebellion against the English. And you start to lean in, oh, this is going to be good. And then I say, but it's about this guy. (laughs) And how he takes his family and he moves to France to start a farm. (laughs) That's how the book of Ruth starts. Limelech and his family move to Moab because there's a famine. And his sons marry Moabite women. And over the course of years, Elimelech and both of his sons die. And so not only have we gone from a story of a seemingly insignificant family, now the women are the only ones who are left. And the story for the people who originally heard it seems even more insignificant. What in the world could this be about? And what we're going to see throughout the course of this story, throughout the course of each chapter of the story, are the people of God engaging with the law of God. And we get to see how they interpret and live it out in different ways. You see, as Naomi begins to process her situation, she knows she's in dire straits. Her husband has died. Her sons have died. Her sons have had no sons. And so now she is left in poverty, helpless and hopeless with nothing left. She's able to move back to Bethlehem and and is taking her daughter-in-laws with her, and she begins to interpret the law in her own mind. She knows that the law says if, if... her husband and her sons die and and they don't have sons yet, that their family was not going to have an heir. And so she looks at her daughter's-in-law and she says, go back. Your only hope is to go back home 
to your family and start over. And sometimes when I've read this story, I've looked at how Orpah responds, the daughter-in-law who leaves and goes back, and I judge her. I say, why couldn't you be like Ruth? Why couldn't you stick it out? But Orpah does what the law says she should do. Naomi has done what the law says she should do. But Ruth has a different perspective. She looks at her mother-in-law and she says, where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. You see, this Moabite woman knew the law, but she also knew the lawgiver. And that lawgiver is a God of steadfast love and kindness. Throughout the Old Testament, you see the people over and over again celebrate the steadfast love and kindness of Yahweh. And Ruth has begun to understand that. She's begun to take that to heart. And she says, even though I know the law says I'm completely free to go back home and start over, I'm choosing out of steadfast love and kindness to walk into poverty and hopelessness with you. Because Naomi has said, my life has become bitter She says, the Lord has raised his hand against me. And Naomi says, I'll go with you. You are in a dark night. You are in a valley. And I'm going to walk through that valley with you. Naomi understands that oftentimes the law is an elementary school teacher And she's giving us a master's level class in the loving kindness of God. And so Ruth and Naomi return home. And Naomi, who's at this point seems has given up, one morning Ruth gets up and she says, I'm going to go out to the fields. And I'm going to gather grain behind the harvesters. Naomi knew the law. In Leviticus 19, Uh, The law reminds us, when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. The law had given the people of God a way to care for those who were poor, for those who had no hope, for those who were struggling. And And Ruth knew this, and so she steps out And she begins to walk to the field to harvest. And she happens to find herself. That's the way the storyteller tells it. She happens to find herself in the field of a wealthy farmer named Boaz. And she starts to work in the field and Boaz returns home. And he notices this woman that he's never seen before. Boaz has lived in Bethlehem his whole life. He knows the people here, but he doesn't know this woman. And so he asks his foreman, who is she? That's Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law. And Boaz has already heard the story of what she has done. And there are a couple important points that we can overlook in this story. There seems to be the assumption that not all of the farmers followed the law. There seems to be the assumption that in some of the fields, the farm hands, the workers, would take advantage of the women who were following along behind. These are the assumptions that were made. It was dangerous for the women, for the foreigners, to come and to gather the grain in these fields. But not in Boaz's field. In Boaz's field, these people were protected. They were cared for. Boaz knew the law. He knew this passage from Leviticus 19. But you see glimpses of Boaz showing us the steadfast love and kindness of God through the law. 
He allows these gathering grain to come and eat lunch with the harvesters. He allows them to drink as the harvesters bring water out of the well. He allows them to drink from that water. And he even pulls one of his foremen aside in Ruth chapter 2 and he says, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her. And pull out some of the heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. You see, Boaz knew the law. But he knew it was the elementary school teacher. But he knew the lawgiver. The lawgiver's steadfast love and kindness. And it led him to a radical generosity. It led him to care for those who were in his field. It led him to care for the hopeless and the helpless in a special way. So Ruth returns home, and she tells Naomi what has happened. And Naomi makes a turn. She turns from bitterness to having a glimmer of hope. Because she knows who Boaz is. She knows that Boaz is one of their family redeemers. She knows the law. She knows the word of God. She knows that this family redeemer is one of the people who is supposed to look out for those others in the family who have fallen on hard times. The family redeemer had a number of responsibilities. If, if a family was going to lose their land and they were going to have to sell the land, the family redeemer would step in and be the one to buy it. So that the, fa- the, so that the land would stay in the family, and then the family could eventually buy it back. Or it was given back to them in the year of Jubilee. So they bought land that might be lost. The family redeemer would seek justice If someone had murdered a member of your family, the family redeemer was the one who would go and seek justice of the murderer. The family redeemer, if the head of a household was going to have to sell themselves into slavery because of debt, the family redeemer would step up and pay the debt for the sake of the family member. And Naomi knew that Boaz was one of their family redeemers. And so she pulls Ruth aside, and they concoct a plan. They're going to call Boaz to redeem their family. And so you get this strange story in Ruth chapter 3, and we don't have time to sort through all of that. But we do know this, that Ruth comes to Boaz And she not only asks for him to redeem the land, but she asks a step more. She says, redeem our family. Marry me. Set the family right again. This isn't the role of the family redeemer. We don't think. That was not the job of the family redeemer. Boaz is well within the rights of the law to say, yeah, I'm not doing that. But Boaz agrees. And something struck me as I was reading the story this time. I think there are times I go into this story and I look at the relationship between Boaz and Ruth, and I assume that there is romance there. I assume that there is a a, a romantic love between these two people. That may be true. I don't know. It doesn't say. But I do know this, that there is covenant love. The Boaz looks at Ruth with a steadfast love and kindness of God. And he says, I'm going to make this right. Friends, that's... That's a big step of faith. That's a huge step of covenant love. You 
And in chapter 4, we get another strange story. There's another family redeemer closer in relation to Naomi than Boaz. And so you see this exchange between Boaz and this unnamed family redeemer. What you don't want to miss from that exchange is the other risk that Boaz is taking. See, Boaz approaches this man and says, Naomi has returned. Her land needs to be redeemed. Are you willing to do that? And he says, sure. That's a good deal for me. I get some land out of it. But Boaz says, don't forget about Ruth, her daughter-in-law. You should probably marry her too. And the man steps back and says, yeah, I'm not in for that. Because it can cause inheritance problems among the family. You see, you have this line of Elimelech through Ruth and the line of the Redeemer. And if those kids start to fight, you've got family drama. And this family Redeemer says, it's well within my rights of the law to pass. And so he does. But Boaz shows the steadfast love and kindness of God to Naomi and Ruth. He understands that the law is an elementary school teacher. And he's giving us a master's class. It's interesting that the story begins with the work, but the story ends with this unnamed family redeemer. Two people who didn't necessarily do anything wrong. They followed the law of God. But they are contrasted against Ruth and Boaz who are willing to take the spirit of the law, willing to lean in and say that our God, the God, the law giver, did not give us the law as an out. He gave us the law as a guideline to show his steadfast love and kindness. And so Boaz and Ruth marry, and they have a son named Obed. And the family is redeemed. It's a beautiful story of a redemption of a family. The seemingly insignificant family is made right. But chapter 4 ends with an interesting footnote, doesn't it? Obed has a son named Jesse. Jesse has a son named David. David, who would become the greatest human king in Israel's history. David, who would be the first in the line to the Messiah, the Redeemer. Ruth and Boaz would later find their names in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. This insignificant family. Finds their name in the family tree of God incarnate. So as I read the book of Ruth again, there were a few things that stood out to me that I'd like to just share with you now. One, Ruth and Boaz show us how to live free from the law. You see, I grew up in a very legalistic tradition, right? I grew up in a tradition that got caught up on do these things, don't do these things, and the list was very specific. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you grew up in that same tradition. It was strict, and oftentimes we had no idea why. Right? When I got to be in middle school, I found out that I couldn't go to the school dance. Why not? I think, at the root of it, there was a fear of sexual dangers. I'm just blunt about it. Dancing might lead to sex. 
And so the law said, don't go to the dance. But the spirit of the law said, look at my sisters in Christ as daughters of God. When I sexualize them, I devalue them. When I sexualize them, I devalue the image of God. And so the legalism had taken place, taken the place of the loving kindness of God. And I constantly wrestled with with Jesus when he would say, You have heard it said, and he would quote a piece of the law, and he would say, but I tell you, and he seemed to raise the stakes, right? I was like, was Jesus getting more legalistic here? I don't know what's happening. And then James jumps in, and he says, faith without works is dead. And I'd go, okay, I'm getting it now. Like, we got to do a bunch of stuff. And then Paul would pipe up, and he would say, you live free from the law. And I say, come on. Clear it up for me. And as I read the story of Ruth and of Boaz, what I see are two people free from the law. They are walking in the law of God, but with freedom. Freedom to give love and kindness and hope and joy and peace. Not out of a rigid legalism, by understanding the God of steadfast love and kindness. It's a beautiful picture of what freedom from the law can look like. The second thing I noticed is that Ruth was a Moabite. She was not a child of the people of God. And yet she was demonstrating what the steadfast love and kindness of God looked like. And friends, I think we run a danger when we think we have the market on God's movement in the world. God is at work in the lives of people sometimes when we don't even know it. And there are times when I think God speaks to us through the lives of people who don't seem like what we think the people of God are supposed to be. And so we don't listen. You see, the Moabites, they were not loved by the people of Israel. They were pagans. And yet Ruth was showing them the steadfast love and kindness of God? Are we listening for God in unexpected places? And third, God fulfilled His promises through the actions of his people. God fulfilled his promises through small, seemingly insignificant actions of his people. I found it interesting that when God made his covenant with Abraham, he, he promised him two things, right? He promised him, you will have a son, and that son will give birth to a people, and they will be as numerous as the sands in the shore and the stars in the sky. He promised him a people, a community, and he promised him a place. You will dwell in a land, a place of provision, a place of security, a place where you can be the light to the nations. What is the story of Ruth about? What does God provide through the work of Boaz and Ruth? He gives Naomi a family again. Naomi's 
family is restored. And their land is redeemed. Their place is made safe. They have a hope and a future. And ultimately, God's redemption of the world comes through the line of Boaz and Ruth. God is at his redeeming work in the life of this individual family and his redeeming work in the life of the world. And there are times, friends, when I think we walk through life thinking what we do is insignificant. And it may seem that way at the time. But we have no idea where God is at work into the future. You may find yourself in a couple of different places this morning. You may find yourself in the place of Naomi. Life is bitter. It seems like God has raised his hand against you. You feel hopeless and helpless. And if you're in that place, I would encourage you to look at Naomi's life. Stay in the community of God. Don't drive people away. Naomi's reaction is to send her daughter-in-laws away. You don't have to suffer through this with me. This is my burden to bear. Ruth says no. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God will be with us and God's people will be with us. Stay in the community. And as best you are able, live in the law of God, looking through the lens of steadfast love and kindness. You may be in the place of Boaz. God has blessed you. God has given abundance to the land. Live in the law of God that leads to generosity, that leads to self-sacrificial giving, that leads to reaching out to those who have less and bringing them in, walking with them on the journey. Be a person of compassion and love and hope. You may find yourself in the place of Ruth. Maybe you're walking along the journey with someone else who's struggling. You don't have the answers. You don't know how this is going to work. Walk through it with them. Friends, that's hard. Recently I had a friend whose wife had died. Had died reasonably young. And I'll never forget his words at the funeral as he was sharing about his life with her, he said this. He said, over the coming weeks, you might see me on the street. The temptation for you is going to be not to talk to me. The temptation for you is going to be to let it blow over before you engage me again. And he said, don't do that, please. He said, I might still be sad. He said, I still have to work through it. But I need you with me. As we look at the life of Ruth, we look at someone who is walking through the darkness with someone else. And she's showing the steadfast love and kindness of God. She's showing hope and a future. She doesn't have an answer. She doesn't have the solution. But she's present. 